right? So if you put instead of the one norm, you put the infinity norm, that's an even better guarantee, right? It's smaller error. So you ideally you want this norm to be you know, a bigger norm. So let's look at the two norm. So there's the count sketch, which actually uh, preceded the count min sketch in time. That was by Charikar, Chen, and Parv Colton. Um, I believe the, the conference version was iCalpo 2, but there's a journal version later, which was in 04, I think. Um, I don't remember exactly. So <coughs> it's the same idea as last time. You have this grid. Right? And here you have t counters here. And you have your, this L times. And again, you have a hash function, which can be pairwise independent. And you hash a guy to one place in every row and add him there. But when you add him there, let's say you want L2 error. What do you think you're going to do inside of this bucket? Right, so with, point, with L1 point query, what we said was you have the guy himself there, and then a 1 over t fraction of the mass might collide with it, collides with him in expectation. So if you set t to be something like 1 over epsilon, then you get good error, right? But now I want to say that, okay, this guy is there, plus there's some other noise which has small L2, right? How can I, what would I do to make that noise of small L2? Any ideas? Yeah, so right, multiply it by random signs. So whenever you add, when you add a guy here, you don't just add him there directly. You have another hash function, sigma. So you have sigma one up to sigma L, where sigma j maps your universe into minus one one, right? And then when you add, when you add someone to a counter, you add him times when you add xi to a counter, you add it, you add xi times sigma j of i times a random sign, right? So now when you look at, <coughs> now when you look at a counter c of, um, let's say, some r comma hr of i, if you look at the counter in the orth row that corresponds to where i hash to, you'll have his sign, sigma, J, sigma r of i, xi, plus a sum of people who collided, right, of uh, sigma r j, xj, where uh, basically hr of j is equal to hr of i, j not equal to i. Right, so now this becomes the noise. Yeah. I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, you mean putting the random signs? Yeah, yeah that's true. So <clears throat> you could say, look, putting random signs like only ever helps me, right? Even if I wanted the L1 case, because I'll have Xi plus, you know, the way we analyze the L1 case is we said we have Xi plus some stuff which only has a, a 1 over t fraction of the L1 mass. This still only has a 1 over t fraction of the L1 mass, plus it might have cancellations now because we have the random signs. So it only you know, can do better. And actually, that, that's, that's true. Um, what you're saying is accurate. Like, in reality, I would always just put the random signs there. Um, but if we wanted to be able to write, if we wanted to be able to write an error term in terms of L2, right? What do we say about this? We'll say, look, this is what we analyzed when we did the AMS sketch. Okay. It's also what you analyzed with this hashing is basically what you analyzed on problem set one. Okay. You expect, so call this error term, uh, you know, call it uh, beta, right? You expect, By computations you're familiar with from the PSAT, you expect beta squared and little release solutions 
soon, so you can look at those as well. We expect expectation of beta squared to basically be um, at most um, 1 over t times the L2 norm squared of x, right? So by Markov, it'll be at most 5 times this, or 3 times this with probability a third, right? And if, <laughs> if beta squared is this, then that implies that, you know, beta is at most 1 over the square root of t times the L2 norm. With probability, uh, let's say three times that, with probability at least two thirds. This is Markov. Okay, so <clears throat> good. So if you wanted to have epsilon times the L2 norm, basically you should set t to be 1 over epsilon squared. Yeah. And so what do you do? You take, you take uh, the counter that i hash to. You multiply that counter by sigma r of i to kill this sign, right? And then what you have is xi plus something that's on this order. And you take the median over all those estimates. Okay, so, um, good. And you can, do, you can look at, um, you know, sparse, re just like at the end of lecture, we looked at sparse, recover, um, sparse approximation using the count min sketch. You can look at sparse approximation, again, using uh, the count sketch. Um, you can look at heavy hitters under L2, et cetera. So let me say one thing about, you know, say state of the art. So <clears throat> let's say you want sparse approximation. For example, you want to recover an X tilde such that X minus X tilde L2 squared is at most 1 plus epsilon times uh, X tail K L2 norm squared, just like the end of last lecture. But let's say now we don't, we don't require x tilde to actually be k-sparse. We just want it to be almost as good as the k-sparse, the best k-sparse approximation. So there's work, for example, that can do this. Um, so this is something there is a final project, so you know I'll occasionally mention things that I won't actually cover, just in case you want to look into it. Um, so what they can do is they can get this kind of guarantee, and um, the sketch size in their guarantee is something like k over epsilon times log of n over k, and they can recover x tilde in time, you know, k times poly log n. <clears throat> so, and we'll get more into this kind of these kinds of uh, sparse recovery guarantees. And if you want, actually, you can even infor you can actually require x tilde to be sparse itself, and then m blows up by another one over epsilon factor. Um, but we'll get when we get into the compressed sensing part of the course, we'll get more into getting these kinds of recovery guarantees from few measurements, um, right? So, what's the motivation for this kind of thing, right? If I can if I can compress x down to a sparse x tilde, for example, let's say x tilde actually is sparse. Well, actually, what am I going to do? I'm going to compress x, for example, to its sketch, right? Such that I can recover x very well with small error from the sketch. When might I want to do that? For example, if I'm compressing images or something, right? So, I, you know, I'm designing JPEG or some other compression scheme. Um, we'll get to more of that later. Okay, so for now, that's all I want to say about heavy hitters, but keep it in mind because it's going to be closely related to compressed sensing when we get there. Um, and there are lots of other works that get various guarantees with various, you know, small sketch lengths, uh, fast update time, et cetera, not just L2, L2. So rest of today, I'm going to talk about L0 sampling which is going to be related to graph algorithms.
So for example, connectivity, finding all the connected components of a graph, uh, k connectivity. So these two I'll cover fully in class, and then I'll probably mention other things you can do, but I won't have time to cover all of them, such as, uh, you know, uh, let's see, uh, min cut, vertex connectivity, vertex cover, et cetera. There are lots of problems that you can solve, and this L0 sampling turns out to be a very useful primitive, okay? So what is L0 sampling? So in general, what is, what is LP sampling? Okay. LP sampling is the following thing. X is updated in, turn, in the turnstile model. Okay. And what do we want to do? We want to we draw a random index i between 1 and n according to a certain distribution. Okay. We want to draw... sample a random coordinate with probability with, uh, with draw random with probability let's say Is it clear what I mean here? Right. Which, this box? No, no, not this box. Here? That box? Uh, this is, um, yeah, so I was talking about the count sketch, which is something like the count min sketch, but it gets you L2 error in your point query instead of L1 error. And um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, if you missed this whole board, it might be better to just watch the video. Yeah, I think you guys, yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to talk about this for the rest of the lecture. This was just uh, a wrap-up of heavy hitters. Yeah, so now, even if you didn't see that board, whatever I say here is uh, independent of that. Okay, good. So at the end of the stream, I want to be able to draw a random sample from one to uh, a random i between one and n according to this distribution. The probability that i is equal to j is proportional to x j to the p. Okay. So, for example, L zero. What is L zero? So, it should really be called L zero to the zero, but uh, people call it the L zero norm, at least in streaming uh, literature. This thing is basically the support size, right? And the reason is, you know, LP to the P, the definition of LP to the P is the sum of XI to the P. Okay. And if you treat 0 to the 0 as being 0, and any, any other non-zero number to the 0 as being 1, then you know when p, this thing is uh, basically the limit, the limit as p goes to zero of this expression is the support size. So that's why people call it the L zero of, of x. Okay. Oh, sorry. So that's just uh, the number of indices i such that x i is not zero. The support, the support. This this set is the support. The support size is the size of the support. So what I want you to do is I want you to draw a random index that's not zero in X. That's L0 sampling. And LP sampling uh, for general P, I believe, was first looked, was first, there was first a solution by Munema Zida, uh, Zade and Woodruff in SOTA 2010. Um, people already knew that it was quite helpful so, for example, people knew that if you could do L2 sampling, um, it gives actually a very simple algorithm for norm estimation, uh, p norm, est 
uh, LP norm estimation for p bigger than two, okay? Um, but you know, the, the first people who, who actually gave an algorithm that provided it, I believe, was this. And since then, there's been more work on various p's, so I'll show you L0 sampling today, and the L0 sampling thing I'll show you is not what they're doing, but uh, some other algorithm. Okay, so <coughs> let's, let's go back to L0 sampling. Um, I also, if you want to see more on this, I recommend there's a survey on L0 sampling by uh, Core Mode and I think Fermani. There are many different solutions to this problem and they kind of give an overview of, of, all, of many of them. Uh, I'm just gonna present you something. Okay. And really the goal here or one of these solutions. The goal is, you know, probability that i is equal to j is going to be equal to uh, basically zero if j is not in the support, and it's going to be one over the support size, plus or minus an error term if J is in the support. Okay, so we're allowing ourselves some error. So we're, <coughs> um, okay. and also with probability delta, we're also allowed to just output fail, okay? So the algorithm can say, sorry, I, I failed and didn't get anybody in the support. Okay. So how are we gonna do this? So we're going to show that if, let's say, y is, um, let's say, c o of 1 sparse can recover y to probability 1 minus delta using o of log 1 over delta rows in our sketch matrix. So we're using linear sketching. Remember, this is the turnstile model. We can delete and insert entries into X. Okay. So first we're going to show a data structure that provides this kind of guarantee. Okay. Um, let's, say, let's say C sparse. Oh, actually, sorry. Let's even just do one sparse. Okay, so if you give me a vector y which has one non-zero entry, then we're going to be able to recover y with probability one minus delta. Actually, we're going to recover it with probability one. Um, also, if the support size of y is not equal to one, so if it's either zero or, or at least two, will output fail. The probability uh, at least one minus delta. So maybe I should say, if it actually is sparse, with probability one, we'll be able to recover it. And if it's not sparse, if it's not one sparse, either it's, it has zero elements or at least two, then we'll be able to s detect that something is wrong and output fail. And then the last ingredient is gonna be uh, geometric sampling, which is something that we've already seen, I think in lecture two for distinct elements. So let me 
actually. And let me put it like this, actually. This part is actually using log when results not rows. And if it actually is sparse, uh, you know, we only need, we're only going to use two rows. So first, let's do bullet number one. Yeah. Yeah. There's only one. There's exactly one non-zero entry in Y, and we just want to know what is it. So. So, so now, for t forget about L zero sampling. We just have a new problem. I'm gonna we're gonna reduce to this problem. We're going to put these ingredients together to get L0 sampling. But one question is just how do you build this function, this data structure? This data structure receives turnstile updates to Y. Okay? And then at the end of the stream, it's promised that um, Y has exactly one non-zero entry in its support. Okay? How do you detect what that index is that has the non-zero entry? The second thing we want is another data structure which can tell me whether or not uh, the support of Y is not one. So think of these as, think of the first two bullets as like two different problems. Okay. So we're going to run these data structures in parallel, let's say. So this detects when the support size is not one. And then we're going to use geometric sampling combined with these two data structures, we'll see that soon, to actually get our final L0 sampling. So the first bullet, I feel like the first bullet is something that you s is related to something that's a popular interview question, you know, like for software engineering companies. Um, does anyone have any ideas for the first one? Now, there are turnstile updates here. So there are insertions and deletions. And I promise you that Y is one sparse. How can you maintain two, two dot products with Y? Basically, two linear, uh, a linear sketch that just has two rows such that you can recover the index. Um, you'll be able to recover both the index and its weight you know, with probability one. There's, there's, not, there's not even any randomness here, actually. This is, a, this is deterministic. This will be randomized. Has anyone uh, seen something like this? Okay, well, I'll just, uh, I'll just reveal. We'll just maintain two counters. Okay. The first counter will be the sum i from 1 to n of yi. Okay. We can maintain that. That's, that's basically, that linear sketch is just a row of all ones. And then the second thing we'll maintain is b, which is the sum from i equals 1 to n of i times yi. Right, so our sketch matrix has all ones in the first row, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, blah, et cetera, in the second row. Right? And if I promise you that y is one sparse, then this will be yi, and this will be i times yi. Right? So y is one sparse implies that the support of y is actually equal to uh, b over a. Right? And yi is equal to a. Okay? Okay, so that's it. That's a. B. Okay? So suppose now we wanted to detect. Um, Let's look at two cases. Case A, we want to detect whether the support size of y is 0. In other words, we want to detect whether or not y is a 0 vector. Okay. Case 2, the support size of y might be bigger than 1. So it might have at least two non-zero entries. We want to be able to detect that as well. So how would you detect, using things you know already, how would you detect whether y is the 0 vector?
so this is turnstile. So the entries of y could be, some could be positive, some could be negative. So if you just maintain the sum of every element, you might have cancellations and think it's zero even though it's not. Okay? But, so for, I mean, you could do one of many things. A vector is zero if and only if, for example, its L2 norm is zero. Right? So just maintain an AMS sketch with uh, failure probability delta. So, you know, detect um, the support size equals zero. So that, that means that y is zero. Right, so y is zero if and only if the L2 norm is zero. And we can we have a way to approximate L2 norms up to constant factor, right? Okay, so okay, how about detecting that the support size is strictly bigger than one? We want to be able to also catch if the support size is two or more. How would you do that? And don't worry about independence of hash functions. Like, pretend you have random hash functions at your disposal. You can usually use Nissan at the very end anyway. Okay, so any ideas for this? It's also going to, it's also, it's a trick that I'm going to be able to write here. So I promise you it's nothing too fancy. Okay. And again, it's something where there are a lot of different ways to do this. Uh huh. So you're saying um, I'll run, I'll run uh, this, I'll run a. That'll recover. That'll tell me uh, a candidate for who the answer is, for what y is, and then I'll test. Let, let's say a returns to me a y prime, right? I, basically, a is a recovery algorithm that spits out a y prime, such that if y, if y actually is one sparse, y prime will equal y. So what you're saying is take that y prime and test whether y prime minus y, that vector, is equal to zero. And you can test that using the AMS sketch, right? Because um, since, since the AMS sketch is a linear sketch, you already have yi in your hand. You already have you know, the sketch times y in your hand. You'll apply the sketch times y prime in post-processing and then subtract it. That works. That's one way. Okay. So one thing you can do, there, there are lots of ways to do this. So let y prime be returned from A, from step A, and then test that test whether pi of y prime minus y is zero, where pi is like an AMS sketch. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly reasonable. Another thing you could do, um, another thing you could do is pick a random hash function, which maps, let's say, n into 0, 1. Let's say it maps n into two counters randomly, right? So for each element from 1 to n, for each element i from 1 to n, y i either gets hashed there or there, OK? And if there are at least two people in the support, then there's at least a one half chance that not everyone gets mapped to both places, right? If the support size is at least two, let's say it contains I1, I, I2, I and many other people as well, there's at least a one half probability that I1 and I2 are mapped to different places. And then what you could do is do an AMS sketch in each of these counters separately, right? And if, the, if you ever get that both of these L2 norms are positive from the AMS sketch, 
then you know that the support size is at least two. Right? And then you can repeat this structure, you know, log one over delta times so that you'll catch it at some, you know, the high probability at some point. So yeah, there are lots of different ways to go about this. <coughs> um, good. Okay, good. So now let's do items, let's do C, um, which is we want to combine A plus B using geometric sampling. to get our final L0 sampler. Okay. How about I do that? I'll create, um, you know, log n virtual streams. This is, again, just like distinct elements. plus one of them. And I'm going to have a hash function, h, which hashes <coughs> n into 0 up to log n, such that the probability that h of i, think of h as totally random for now, the probability that h of i is j is equal to 1 over 2 to the j. And I'll include index i in, um, in the vector y of h of i. Say again? Um, okay, so maybe. <coughs> Okay, maybe that was a confusing word. All I want to say is this. So, really there's one stream, right? Streaming updates to this vector x in the turnstile model. I'm actually going to view my stream as actually being um, kind of log n streams in parallel. Okay? When I see an update to index i, I want to know which stream should I include that update in? It's going to get, it's basically going to get hashed to be included in only one of the streams. And which stream is it going to be included in? It's going to be included in the stream h of i. Okay. Um, maybe I need a bit plus one here just because otherwise everyone will, otherwise this thing doesn't even sum up to one. But, uh, Right, so, so now my vector x has sort of been split, on, split into these log n different vectors, y0 up to y log n. The vector yj, basically the vector yj is yj, or let's say yj is equal to x restricted to the coordinates i such that h of i is equal to j. Right, so <clears throat> basically uh, yj is a projection of x to a subset of the coordinates, namely the coordinates that actually got hashed to j, which is a 1 over 2 to the j fraction of the coordinates. Okay? Okay, so why might I be doing this? Well, we know that the support size is actually some number between, um, by the way, okay, so this, um, let me just say something and then we can ignore that case. There might be the case where x is actually the zero vector and then there's nothing in its support. Okay, so the way we'll deal with that is We'll keep an AMS sketch on the side for x. And if, if that AMS sketch says that the L2 norm of x is 0, 
then we're just going to we're just going to output fail. We're going to say this thing doesn't have anything in its support. Okay, so let's just pretend now. So now let's assume that uh, X actually has something in its support. So the support size of X is some number between one and n, right? And the expectation of the support size of yj is, what is that? That thing times? Yeah, exactly. It's the support size of x over 2 to the j plus 1, right? This follows by the, su the support size of yj is a sum of indicator random variables, and this follows by linearity of expectation. Okay? So, and remember now, we, we're going where j 0 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to log n. So, in other words, there is going to be some j, right? So this implies like there exists some j star such that the expectation of the support size of yj is between basically 2 and 1. Right? There is, a, there is going to be one of these virtual streams that actually you expect only, only a constant number of people to be in the support. Okay? Okay, good. So <laughs> what's the probability that you have exactly one? Right? If we have exact, the good case is that we have exactly one. And if we have exactly one, Remember, we're going to feed this. We're going to feed all of these yj data structures or yj vectors separately into the data structures from a and b. What we hope happens is that one of these log n vectors will actually be one sparse, and then we'll feed it into a, and then figure out what that thing is, and we'll get a random element of the support. Okay. We also have to make sure we can detect when yj isn't actually one sparse. Because we don't want to just output some nonsense. A might output nonsense if y is not one sparse. But that's what B gives us. If yj is not one sparse, we'll catch that with high probability. And then we'll say yj wasn't one sparse. We're not going to use it. Okay. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> so let's look at this j star. The probability that um, y j star, the support size of this thing, is exactly equal to 1, OK? So let's, let's think about this. We have, <clears throat> let's just call this, let's give this thing a name. The support size of x, let's just call that t, OK? So, We have, let's look at something simpler. Let's say we have t, we have t items, and we sample each one uh, independently with probability 1 over t, right? What's the probability that exactly one item survives? So let's say t items are each sampled you know, are each uh, kept, let's say, independently with probability 1 over t, what's the probability that the number of items kept is equal to 1? Where t for us uh, ah. um, yeah, good. So I'm imagining that 
2 to the j star is basically equal to t, right? So I'm imagining that we have these t items, we're sampling them at a rate of 1 over t, up to, up to a factor of 2 anyway. What's the problem that exactly 1 survives? So the probability exactly one survives is basically the sum i goes from 1 to t, probability that item 1 survives, or item i survives, and no one else does. And let's say they're all being sampled independently. So this is the sum i goes from 1 to t. The probability that item i survives is 1 over t. The probability that no one else survives is something like 1 minus 1 over t to the um, uh, uh, to the one, uh, 1 to the t minus 1, I guess. So this thing gives me 1. So this is equal to 1 minus 1 over t to the t minus 1. And kind of 1 minus 1 over x to the x is roughly, um, is roughly 1 over e, right? So this is, roughly, this is roughly 1 over e, basically. Yeah. Yeah, but um, OK, sure, that's, that's fair enough. But, uh, um, one over this, I guess. Uh, that's right. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still calling that one over this. I, I'll, the only thing I really care about is that this thing is a constant. Okay? All right, the only thing I really care about is that it's at least a constant. Okay? <coughs> um, and in reality, we have t items, but we're sampling at a rate which is not really 1 over t, but it's between 1 over t and uh, 2 over t. But that doesn't really change this calculation by much. The point at the end of the day is the problem that exactly one person survives is still a constant. Okay. So good. So now what do we have? Um, basically, we're done now, right? So if we do one instantiation of this geometric sampling, what we know is that there is, going, there is going to be a level, namely level j star, such that with constant probability, y of j star will actually be 1 sparse. And what is that index that survived? Well, because we're doing random sampling, it's a random index. Okay. And by a and b, we're going to be able to recover that random index. Okay. Well, by a, we'll be able to recover that random index. And for all the other yj's that weren't actually sparse, B will detect that, and then we'll reject them. Okay. Now, that's only constant probability of success. If I want delta uh, probability of failure, then I repeat, I repeat the geometric sampling thing, log 1 over delta times, and take the first one that actually gives me a sample that works. Okay. And at the end of the day, the final space bound So let's, let's count in machine words. Each counter, let's say, takes one unit of space. So each time we do a geometric sampling, we have log n different a's and b's that are running. a just takes two counters. b takes log 1 over delta counters. So that's log n times log 1 over delta. And we're repeating the geometric sampling thing another log 1 over delta times. So. Um, Actually, you need to be a little careful. I guess you want to say that you want to say that b always succeeded for all of the log n different levels. So you should really run b with a failure probability that's like delta over log n, right? Because you're you're calling b on log n different. You're doing b on log n different uh, levels of this geometric stream. But okay. But anyway, let's ignore that. 
uh, that thing because we're going to have a log of 1 over delta anyway. So th it's roughly basically log n times log squared 1 over delta counters. And if you try and derandomize this, you know, let's say I don't have random hash functions, um, I guess the AMS, AMS sketches here just need four wise independence. That's fine. We do also have this hash function, that hash function h. Okay. And the, when I analyzed h, I said that kind of all of these were independent. That's why I got 1 over t times 1 minus 1 over t to the t minus 1. If I wanted to be able to carry out exactly this analysis, then I need full independence, right? Which means um, t could be as big as n. I need n-wise independence. I can't afford that. That requires n spaces for the hash function. So I'll just derandomize. You know, if I don't want to think about it, I'll just derandomize this whole thing using Nissan's PRG. Okay. So I'll leave that as an exercise. How do you set up the branching program, et cetera? That needs to be fooled. But basically, this is a small space algorithm. Okay. And if you feed the randomness that determines the hash function h to this small space algorithm, then you, know, you, can, you can instead feed it a pseudorandom h specified by Nissan. So that will blow you up by another factor of log r, where you need r random bits. Right? How many random bits do you need in that hash function? Polynomial in n. Right? They're n hash. They're, there are n inputs to that hash function. Each one is a number between log n, 1 and log n. So the total number of bits to specify h is something like n times log log n. Anyway, it's like poly n. So the number of randomness you need, the amount of randomness you need to feed in the small space algorithm is poly n. And Nissan blows your space up by another log r factor. So log n. So log squared n, log squared 1 over delta counters after Nissan. Okay, so it's polylogarithmic. It's much less than n is the bottom line. Um, and I should point out, I'll just say this. Um, It's known that you can achieve O of log n times log 1 over delta counters, or machine words. I'm imagining, let's say each machine word holds log n bits. Known you can achieve like log n machine word, log n times log n over delta machine words. That was due to uh, Joe Harry, uh, Soglom, Tarnish. And, it's, and they also proved a lower bound saying that for constant delta, this is optimal. Okay, so I believe it's an open problem as to whether or not you can do better for small delta than this. Maybe you could hope for log n plus log 1 over delta. I'm not sure. Um, and I don't want to get into the details fully. We're going to see, because there are some tools they use that we're going to see more in the compressed sensing world when we get there. But the basic idea there is as follows. So the reason that we kind of suffered in our space bound okay, is the following. So there are two reasons. One is we detected, we recovered y sparse vectors. We recovered a sparse vector. Let's say that, we, let's say we had actually put s here. It's s sparse. Or no, no. let's go back to one. So we have this one sparse vector. We recovered it using O of one measurement, measurements. But Part B, which detected whether it was one sparse, actually took log 1 over delta measurements. Right? So even though it's one sparse, we spent log 1 over delta measurements to detect that. So what JST does is actually they replace one sparse with S sparse, where S is some theta of log 1 over delta. Okay. They can detect whether you're not actually S sparse using log 1 over delta measurements. And that's exactly what you said. Basically, the way they do it 
is run your stuff, run your thing from A, and this becomes this becomes theta s. Run your thing from A. That's going to give you a vector. And then test whether y prime minus y is 0 using the AMS sketch. Right? So there's no, there's no log 1 over delta overhead. Right? This thing is already as sparse, and you're spending kind of s extra measurements to test that. That's one, that's one way they're winning. And the way that you do A is there are several algorithms that do this. One is Prony's method. I don't know if anyone's heard of Prony's method, which apparently was discovered in 1795. Okay, so uh, basically people were doing streaming, you know, since this back then. Well, no, no, not really. Actually, basically what Prony's method says is take the do the following thing. Let your sketch matrix be the first two S rows of the discrete Fourier matrix. If your input vector is actually S sparse. Prony's method can recover, can recover uh, the vector using those first two S rows of the discrete Fourier matrix. Right? So in fact, two S rows. There's also like Berlekamp Massey algorithm from the 60s, which also can get you theta S rows. Okay, so that's one place they win. And then the other place is they say, rather than try to sample, rather than try to sample to the place where there's only one guy surviving, which, which succeeds with constant probability. Sample to the place where S guys survive. Okay. Where S is theta log 1 over delta. And if you sample to the place where S guys survive an expectation, then you'll actually have roughly S guys survive with probability 1 minus delta. That's the turnoff bound. Because S is log 1 over delta. And actually, those two things, those changes are really the, the only differences between what they did and what I just said on the board. Okay. I just didn't want to cover that because, well, you guys, you know, you don't know the details of Prony's method yet. Why does it work? Put Berlkamp Massey, et cetera. But, you know, even this, the best known algorithm is not very far from what I just showed you. Okay. <clears throat> so questions about L0 sampling? That's, that is L0 sampling. If there are no questions, then let's see how to use it for some problems. I promised you that today we'd, uh, we'd actually do some like graph, graph problems in the screening method. So, so on to graphs. So let's say that G is equal to VE, and then we see edges E and E in the stream. Okay. Let's look at one problem, a simple problem. Connectivity. We're allowed to query IJ, and this should be one if I and J, if let's say J, this is an undirected graph. If i, j are in the same connected component and zero otherwise, we just want to know can, is i reachable from j or vice versa. So let's pretend there are no deletions, insertion only. Okay. Who thinks you can solve this problem in polylog space? Okay, so no, uh, no one raised their hand. Does anyone think that you cannot solve this problem in polylog n space? So, sorry. Uh, well, the number of edges is always at most n squared, so polylog n, polylog n are the same thing. But let's say um, the size of v is n and the size of e is m. So any, uh, so what's one algorithm? What's the most, you know, straightforward space bound that you can achieve? 
Don't think. Just, just uh, something that someone who's never even been in this class would, would say. You can use O of M space, right? You can just remember all the edges. Okay? And then at the end of the day, do a DFS and then figure out if they're in the same connected compartment. So, but M could be as big as N squared, or N choose two in an undirected graph, right? So my question is, can we do better? Okay. Well, <laughs> yes, we can do, okay, we can definitely do better than M. So let's say insertion only. So straightforward. is, let's say, O of M space. I claim there's still something that's pretty straightforward, but I'll call it uh, straightforward uh, minus minus. So it's just slightly less straightforward, but it's still pretty straightforward. Can you beat M space? I just want to be able to answer connectivity queries. That's the only kind of query I care about. So the straightforward one is you remember every single edge and then do a DFS to answer the query. Something um, slightly less straightforward, but less space. So I say it again? O of n space? Okay, how are you gonna do O of n space? Oh, but okay, so when a query comes, you don't know ahead of time what i and j are gonna be for the query. They could be any i and j. So if you just remember the neighbors of a single vertex, I might ask you connectivity about people over here, and then you have, you have no idea, right? Yeah, so store, store a spanning forest, basically. Right, so O of n space, you know, store a spanning forest. Right? A forest can have at most n minus one edges. There's no reason to store, like if there are no deletions, there's no reason to remember edges that are connecting things that are already in the same connected component anyway. Right? So just remember the tree edges, basically. Okay, and so claim any deterministic algorithm needs omega n space. Proof? Okay. The proof is again by an encoding argument. So I'll just show you. <clears throat> Suppose we had an x which is in 0, 1 to the n, and we wanted to encode x. We'll have vertex one over here, and then we'll have we'll have vertex zero over here, I'm sorry. And then we'll have vertex one, two, three, up to vertex n. Okay. If the ith bit, if the ith bit of uh, if the if the first bit of x is a one, we'll put the edge. If the second bit of x is not a one, we won't put the edge. So some of these will have edges and some won't. Now who is zero connected to? He's exactly connected to the people who have a one, a one in the ith bit of x, right? So if you can solve, if you have a, if you have a, a sketch of this in s bits of space, you can use that sketch to answer all the connectivity queries and figure out which bits were one and recover x. Therefore, your s has to be at least n. What if you had a randomized algorithm? Then by an argument very similar to what was in your p set, there's like a large, uh, there's like a large uh, subset of zero one to the n that you could still recover. Therefore, you still need omega n bits. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is even true for a randomized algorithm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. This motivated uh, folks back in 05, so um, I believe it was Feigenbaum 
at all. I'll put the exact reference in the notes. They use this term semi-streaming. you want you know o of n times poly log n space right so for graph problems you, trivially you can always solve the problem in m space which is n squared potentially they wanted to be able to solve graph problems in n times poly log n space so much less than n squared because it turns out for lots of graph problems that you might want to solve um, you can prove that you can't do anything uh, with sublinear space. <clears throat> so, good. So this is connectivity. Now I want to show you something interesting. We're going to get to L0 sampling at some point, right? What if now my graph has insertions and deletions? So I'm on a social network. People can friend me and they can also unfriend me. Okay. And now I want to be able to detect whether or not two people have a path of friends between them. Okay. So connectivity queries or, yeah, connectivity queries in, in, uh, the, in the turnstile model, where edges can be inserted and deleted. Okay. So this was, there's a paper about graph sketching which is what I'm going to present now. And this was due to on Guha and McGregor. It's, it's a very nice and clean idea. So <coughs> first, let me write down an algorithm that's not a streaming algorithm. And then we'll show that we can, implementing, we can implement it using L0 sampling in the streaming model in n times polylog n space. Okay. So and actually, we, we won't just answer connectivity queries. We'll actually be able to know all of like, the connected components of the graph. Okay. So connected components. G is VE. So initially what we're going to do, we're going we're to maintain a, we're going to maintain a, uh, a set of connected components, okay? But they're not going to be maximal. And then iteratively we're going to grow them until they are maximal. So initially, S is our set of components that we're maintaining. That's going to be the family of, you know, uh, basically V1, V2, Vn. So we start, we start each vertex in its own component. And then what we do is, for i equals 1 to log n, you know, for each S in capital S, uh, let's say all these, let's say all these steps happen in parallel. For each S in little s, for each little s in capital S, pick an edge E equals SW for some W in capital S. Contract the edge. Okay. Yeah, question? Yeah, so I'm, S is a set of sets, 
And I'm thinking of these elements of S as being super nodes. So. Yeah, so little s will be a component. But I'm treating that component as like a super node. To, to some other super node. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, <clears throat> exactly. So, for example, let's say that I start off with uh, um, you know, this graph. Okay. Let me call these. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So initially, each one of these is an, is an, is an element of capital F. Capital S is size 8. Then each super node is going to select someone to contract with. So this guy is going to pick an edge that leaves him. And this guy, uh, there should be an edge here as well, let's say. Maybe A and E choose each other, B and F choose each other, C and G choose each other, D and H choose each other. So we contract all those edges. So this becomes, A, E becomes like a super node. B, F becomes a super node. C, G becomes a super node. And so does D, H. And what are the edges between the super nodes? Well, there's an edge from A to B, so that's an edge from these guys. There's an edge from F to G, that's this guy. And there's an edge from C to D. That's that, right? And then we do the same thing. Maybe the, they don't even have to choose the same people. Maybe AE will choose BF and BF will choose CG. Okay. Well, I guess if that happens, then everyone will just contract in, in one step. But again, you know, these two guys might merge together and these two guys might merge together. And then, and then in the next iteration, finally, they'll merge with each other and we have one connected component. So, okay, so this thing is a correct algorithm to find all the connected components in a graph. Why is it correct? Okay. Because at, at any step, if I have a number k of components which aren't actually maximal, that if they're not maximal, that means they'll find a partner to merge with this step. So if I have k guys who aren't maximal, in the next step I'll have at most k over 2. Initially, the number of components I have is n, because every vertex is by itself. So after log n, after log n iterations of this, I can be sure that, every com that all the, all the non-maximal components have disappeared. Okay. They've halved log n times. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a, like a meta algorithm. Uh, you know, now we're going to actually implement it uh, in the streaming model. So I, di I didn't give you any details about how to actually implement this. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, tr in traditional algorithms, one thing, one way you can implement this is using, like, a union fine data structure, right? So, um, kind of the name of the component is, is a find in union find, and then a contraction would just be a union of those two. And you can do those in, like, inverse Ackerman amortized time. Really fast. Okay, so, so now, how about... The streaming, a turnstile streaming implementation. Okay, so here's what we're going to do each vertex will store a vector f of v, which is an n choose 2 dimensional vector. Okay. And if you look at the, the eth entry, or let's say the, the a bth entry of this thingy, um, <laughs> is equal to 0 if uh, v is not a or b, 
or um, AB is not an edge. So basically, AB is a potential edge. If AB doesn't involve V at all, it's zero. If it's either, if, if one of these things is actually V, then it's, it's not, it's, it'll be zero still if that, if that edge is actually not in our set of edges. Otherwise, it'll be plus one if V is equal to the min of AB and minus one if V is equal to the max of AB. And then what we'll say is, for s in this set, capital S over there, f of s is the sum over all v and s of f of v. Okay. I have a question. What is the support of f of s? What is the support of f of v? Yeah, that's the size of the support, but yeah. The, but the support itself, the support is the set of all edges incident upon V. What's the support of F of S? Let's say that U and V are both in S. And let's say that U and V is an, UV is an edge. UV is an edge and they're both in S, right? Then if you look at F of U and look at that edge's entry, It'll be either plus one or minus one. If you look at f of v and look at that entry, it'll be the opposite sign. So they cancel. So edges that stay within s get canceled. Edges that don't exist at all are zero. The only things that survive in this are edges that leave s. Right? The set of all edges in E such that E is in S cross, you know, V minus S basically, or let's say little s cross capital S minus little s basically. So something like that. Those don't cancel. Because we only sum over the things in little, this is little s, I'm sorry. Right, so if there's an edge that leaves little s, there is a guy who has the opposite sign who would have canceled it. But he doesn't participate in this sum. We're only summing over the guys in little s. Yeah, it is, a, it is either positive or negative. That's right. Right, so, so here's, here's, here's little s, right? And then there are a bunch of other components that live other places. There are a bunch of edges in here. There are some edges that leave, right? This guy and this guy, their f's are getting summed together, which means this edge gets canceled. We're summing up, we're summing up all of the f values in here. This is, this is my little s. We're summing up all these f values, right? That's what this is. So we're summing up this guy's f value as well. So this gets canceled because this guy's here. This gets canceled, this, this edge gets canceled because of this guy as well. This edge that leaves, we're not summing this guy because he's not in little s. So this doesn't get canceled. So he stays in the support of f of little s. Right? So now we're done. We can implement this algorithm using L0 sampling. Why? At every vertex, we're not actually going to store f of v. What do we need to be able to do? We need to be able to sample from the support of vectors. We're not going to actually store f of v at every vertex. We're going to store an L0 sampler sketch of f of v. And an L0 sampler sketch only takes polylog space. So there are n vertices. Each one is storing this polylog space L0 sampler sketch. That's n times polylog. Okay. And then now, when we want to know a vert, when we want to know an edge that leaves 
When we want to know an edge that leaves v, let's say in the very first iteration, when s is just a set of all vertices, we want to know an edge that leaves v, we just ask the L0 sampler, give me an edge, and it'll give me one. Right? And then now I want to do this contraction. I want to merge those two components together. What do I do? I just sum their f values. This one had an f value, this one had an f vector, this one had an f vector, this one had an f vector. I sum them together, and the new f vector is exactly the edges that leave that new component. Right? But I'm storing a linear sketch. So to add these vectors, I just need to add the linear sketches together. Okay, so that's it. There's one thing you have to be you have to be a little careful about is we're going to use log n different L0 sampler sketches, you know, basically a1 of f of v up to a log n of f of v. So in iteration one, we're going to use sketch one, this iteration. In iteration two, so okay, now we've used, we've used all the A1 sketches in iteration one. We've done our L0 sampling. We contracted a bunch of edges. Okay, so now what we're going to do is the first sketch told us which edges to contract. We're going to do that contraction in all of the remaining sketches, basically by just adding the appropriate sketches together. And then in iteration two of that loop, we're going to use a2 as our L0 sampler. That's going to tell us some edges to contract. We're going to add all those sketches together in A3 and beyond. Now we're going to use A3 to do our L0 sampling in the third iteration, et cetera. Why don't we just use the same sketches throughout the entire algorithm? So this is, this is actually somewhat subtle. Yeah. Yeah, ex it's, ex it's exactly that. This adaptivity issue, right? If you have a randomized algorithm, what does the correctness guarantee mean for your randomized algorithm? It assumes that the queries that you are going to make are independent of the randomness of the algorithm itself. When we say that an algorithm works with probability one minus delta, it's assuming that the queries you're making to that algorithm don't depend on your previous interaction with that algorithm. There's no adaptivity here. Okay? So if we do the edge contraction, if, if we contract some edges, which edges are we contracting? We're contracting the edges that A1 told us to contract. Right? So then in the future, when we do more queries, right, those queries depend upon the state of the graph that was influenced by A1's randomness. So this is an adaptive setting. So we can't just use the same sketch to answer queries based on that graph, which is why we use a fresh sketch using completely independent randomness, namely A2. And our correctness guarantee will still hold. But that just blows up our overall space by a log n factor, because we're just storing log n sketches instead of one. So overall, we're using n poly log n space. Okay. Um, so there are some other things that, you know, we're out of time basically, but this idea of L0 sampling has been used for min cut, vertex connectivity, vertex cover. Um, uh, well, lots of, actually, lots of problems. There are some nice papers, too, upcoming in this soda in 2016. Um, uh, maximum weight matching, maximum case colorable subgraph. There are lots of graph problems where this, this primitive and other nice sketching primitives are useful for solving those problems. Okay. So questions? So anyway, I'll see you guys Tuesday.